Hello everyone, welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. Today I'll be continuing with Burn Your Wings. This will be part four, chapter four, entitled Because Life Isn't Fair. Toshinori, as all mine, first officially meets the class 1A on the second day of school. He comes in for their foundational hero studies class, namely the trial of battle, and tells them all to gear up in their hero costumes. He's in the process of complimenting everyone's costume when he gets a chance to glance at Midoriya and promptly does a spit take. Young Midoriya's costume is a green jumpsuit with a sturdy white mask covering his lower face, completed by a hood with two appendages sticking straight up. Some small part of Toshinori recognizes that it must be a tribute to his own tufts of hair, but the rest of him is caught up by the sight of Midoriya's hair bun poking out of the back of the hood like a fluffy bunny tail and the two appendages waving like ears. There's no denying it. With his bunny ears and fluffy ha- ta- tail hair, young Midoriya looks exactly like a green rabbit now, and judging by his face, he has no clue. This child is priceless. Joshinari turns his back to the glass and stuffs his fist into his mouth in a desperate attempt to choke down his laughter. His only saving grace is that his students are too busy gawking at UA's expensive facilities to notice that the symbol of peace is shaking pathetically in a corner. Well, most of his students. Toshinori notices that young Uraraka has a hand to her mouth as well, and her eyes are practically shining as she stares at Midoriya's costume and hair with something akin to delighted awe. He has a feeling she's seeing the same thing that he is. Izuku watches wordly as All Might explains the combat simulation. Until just a moment ago, All Might had his back turned to the class, a hand over his mouth while shaking uncontrollably. Thankfully, no one other than Izuku seems to have noticed, but he's worried that the hero might be overdoing it. The fact that there doesn't seem to be any blood coughed up at least soothes a little bit of his worry. Sir, Ida raised a hand after All Might explains the exercise. How will we form pairs when we have an odd number of students? A hush falls over the class as everyone is reminded of yesterday. True to his word, Aizawa had expelled the lowest-ranking student on the spot, who happened to be Mineta Minoru. It had only been the first day of class, so no one really knew each other yet, and what little they had seen of Mineta hadn't been all that complimentary. But it was still jarring to see the expulsion of a fellow classmate on the first day. All Might's attempts to expel the gloom by beaming his signature smile you have a point, young Ida. It will simply be that some teams have extra members. That doesn't really sound fair, Ribbit. Nonsense. Of course it isn't. But life isn't fair, you embryos. And it certainly isn't kind, Izuku thinks as he eyes the matchups. Hero team. Midoriya and Uraraka versus Villa team. Villain team. Bakugo and Ida. Izuku's eyes unconsciously travel across their assembled classmates to find Bakugo. The other boy is already looking at him, red eyes burning amidst the black of the mask he has over his eyes. Their eyes meet. Not a single word passes between them. Izuku is five years old, and he and Inko had just moved away from their old house, as if trying to flee from the very memory of Hisashi. They're quietly walking home after getting groceries when a bright, strong voice calls out to them. Oh, hiya there. I didn't know there was anyone else around here with a munchkin of their own. The two Midorias turn to find a woman with red eyes and ash-blonde hair smiling at them, with her own bag of groceries and a miniature replica, just as any passerby would look at Inko and Izuku and know their mother and son. Izuku and Inko look at the pair and instantly know that they are mother and son. Oh, um, Inko starts nervously. We just moved in today, you see. The woman beams. Welcome, then. I'm Bakugo Mitsuki, and this midget here is my Kotsky. She smiles, pushing her her down her boy's head into a bow with her hand without even looking at him. The boy looks disgruntled, but used to it. There's an easy dynamic there, born through familiarity and affection, something that Inko and Izuku have been too cautious to dare to have. Hi, um, Midoriya Inko, and this is Izuku. Inko manages instead. Hizashi is still too fresh in Inko's mind for her to be anything less than a jittery mess. But Mitsuki doesn't seem to mind as she smiles brightly. It's a pleasure. Say, do you want to chat for a bit? It's not even... It's not every day that I get to meet someone my age around here. I'll fill you in on all the gossip around town. Kotsky can show Izuku-kun the playground in the meantime. Inko looks down at Izuku with a lost expression. Izuku meets her eyes and looks across at Bakugo Mitsuki for a long moment as if sizing her up. Eventually, Izuku slips his hand out of Inko's and takes a step away. 
He smiles up at her. It'll be okay, Mom, he says. Go have fun. Inko looks so incredibly lost for a moment when her son says words that usually a mother should say to her son, but she is saved from having to make a reply when Mitsuki happily claps her hands. All right, come on then, Inko. I can call you Inko, right? Kotsky, you take care of Izuku-kun, you hear? Yeah, yeah, the little boy grumps, but then it turns to Izuku with a grin. The others should already be at the playground. Come on. Izuku's heart skips a little, and he tentatively smiles back. For the first time, he thinks he might have a friend. But of course he doesn't, because life isn't fair, and it certainly isn't kind. Bakugo turns out to be fond of shoving, showing off his flashy quirk, and when Izuku clamps his mouth shut whenever he's asked what his own quirk is, the boy takes to taunting Izuku that he must be a quirkless loser and starts looking down on him. Izuku bears his taunts and cruel nickname, Deku, with silence because it's better than showing his quirk. At this point in life, all five-year-old Izuku knows about his quirk is that he inherited the destructive fire from his father and that it made his mother scream. But when Bakugo starts bullying someone else in front of Izuku, all he does is the only thing he can. He steps between them. Bakugo looks astonished at first. Then he laughs with youthful cruelty. You playing at hero, Deku. You don't even have a quirk. I have a quirk, Izuku says on reflex. Yeah, then show it. Izuku doesn't, because he really, really wishes he didn't have this quirk. But his silent defiance only seems to enrage Bakugo. The boy practically fumes and explodes. explosions crackle violently out of his palms. I said show it, he spits, but Izuku is too frozen at the sight of the explosions that look so much like fire to even be aware of Bakugo anymore. Bakugo seems to instinctively notice that Izuku's attention isn't on him. He, rec he rectifies this by running full force at Izuku with his palms blazing. Izuku makes it back home to find Inko and Mitsuki seated side by side with a plate full of cookies between them. The snacks were probably brought by Mitsuki since neither Izuku or Inko had the concept of food being pleasure yet. The two women are laughing together over something, Mitsuki loud and free with her head thrown back and Inko softly and cautiously from behind her hand. But she's still laughing. Izuku stands there frozen, staring at his mother like he's never seen her before. Eventually, Inko notices him, and she's more attuned to his silent presence. Oh, welcome back, darling, she says, as she catches sight of him and she's still smiling. But then Inko's eyes widen as she takes in Izuku's dirty clothes. A tinge of familiar fear enters those green eyes that had been filled with mirth just a moment ago. What, what happened, dear? She asks in a whisper. Izuku looks at his mother, who's looking at him with fear, and then at the woman who had been able to make her smile and laugh. Izuku has only ever been able to make his mother worried, afraid, or cry, but Bakugo Mitsuki had managed to make her not only smile, but actually laugh in just the short time that they've been together, like it's as easy as breathing. And as much as it hurts, he realizes then and there that he could never do anything to take that away from her. So, Izuku clasps his hand behind his back to hide the burns and bruises on his arms, and he plasters a smile on his face. I just fell, Mom. Baku... But no, Izuku realizes with a startling intellect for a five-year-old, if he's going to sell this, he's going to have to do better than that. Kachan and I were playing in the sandbox. Sorry for the mess. It's instantly apparent that it was the right move. Inko visibly relaxes, and Mitsuki starts cooing. He lets you call him Kachan. That's so adorable. Mitsuki begins talking excitedly again with Inko, smiling tentatively at her new friend. Izuku quietly backs out and heads to his own room to treat his, his wounds in privacy. Izuku had already made a habit of wearing long sleeves because of the numerous scars and wounds that Hisashi gave him periodically, but from that moment he begins wearing long sleeves all the time, even inside the house, even in front of Inko. Bakugo continues picking on others to assert himself at the top of their secluded food chain. Izuku bears the bullying pointed at him silently, but when Bakugo, go when Bakugo goes for another target, he steps between them. He never really fights back. He's never learned to fight back. Bakugo reminds Izuku so much of Hizashi, and his explosions look so much like violet fire that Izuku practically freezes up whenever he's confronted with them. He just gets back up and between Bakugo and his would-be victim without protest, without even a cry of pain at the bruises and minor burns. 
It's nothing compared to Hisashi's abuse, after all. Izuku's silent defiance somehow seems to enrage Bakugo all the more, but each time Izuku wordlessly faces down his rage and explosions, all he could think is, You have nothing on my father. Izuku steps between Bakugo and the children he tries to bully time and time again. Just like Hisashi stopped going for Inko and started coming straight for Izuku, eventually Bakugo does the same, stops trying to bully other children, and just singles out Izuku for ridicule and bullying. And really, as powerful as Bakugo's quirk is, he still has nothing on Hisashi. All Izuku has known before this point is violence, after all, and bullying just pales in comparison. If this is the price Izuku has to pay so that Inko thinks that they're friends and can enjoy her new friendship with Mitsuki, then he'll put up with it. He'll gladly put up with it. So Izuku never stops following the blonde around dutifully and quietly. After all, Hisashi had taught him to step between people, to get up, no matter how much fear shakes his limbs, to push aside and ignore the pain. But he's never taught him how to run away. So Izuku stays by Bakugo's side. Izuku's nine, and he keeps three steps beside, behind Bakugo as they both walk home. Inko had become best friends with Mitsuki, and currently the two had gone out for dinner dates, so they can't pick them up. Izuku is happy for his mother because now that Hisashi is gone, not only can she indulge in human contact outside the house, but Inko can finally discover the joy of eating what and when she wants, with the enthusiastic help of Mitsuki. Inko has changed so much in the few years since Hisashi's arrest and their move. She's less jittery and nervous, doesn't jump at every single footstep, has filled out more, and actually smiles. She still hasn't completely gotten over her pyrophobia, like Izuku has managed to, but... But of course, a cruel phantom breathes in his ear. How can she when you yourself are a living reminder? No, Izuku protests faintly. I will never use your fire. I will never be like you. The phantom laughs. You know what they say, boy, like father, like son. No, I won't. I'll never. Will you shut the fuck up, you fucking nerd? Quit your mumbling, Bakugo snaps, and Izuku clicks his mouth shut. Izuku is in middle school, and this time, instead of stepping between Bakugo and his would-be victim, he steps between a slime villain and Bakugo, who is his would-be victim. Later, Bakugo catches Izuku by the scruff of his neck and slams him into a wall. What the actual fuck, you quirkless shit, Deku? Where did you pull that quirk out of? All this time, I tell you to show your quirk and you only use it now? He's referring to how Izuku had pulled him out of the slime villain's grasp. Izuku realizes, of course, even half-suffocating and scared witless, Bakugo's not an idiot. Of course he'd noticed. But that doesn't mean that Izuku's going to explain his quirk, his fire, because no matter if Bakugo's smoking hands are near his throat or if he's frothing right in Izuku's face, he still has nothing on Hisashi. I never said I was quirkless, Kachan, is all he ends up saying quietly. He doesn't even flinch at the small explosions that go off near his face. He's long since gotten over his pyrophobia, after all. Bakugo himself had made sure of that. Bakugo keeps him by the collar, face twisted in rage and frustration, and... Is that hurt? No, he finally says. I guess you didn't. Bakugo lets go of Izuku, as if he's been burned, still looking at Izuku with those unreadable eyes. Stop looking down on me, Deku, you fucking arrogant bastard. And with that accusation, he turns around without another word. Izuku is 15 and in UA and going through the quirk assessment test. Every time he uses pool and violently coughs up fire into his hand in a desperate attempt to keep it back, he feels two sets of eyes on his back. One is Aizawa, who probably can't let his glaring weakness slide as a teacher. The other, the O, oh, is Bakugo, who has been glaring murderously at Izuku since Ida's comment about Izuku placing first in the practical exam. Bakugo watches Izuku's casual display of his quirk with almost frightening intensity. He doesn't say a word or approach Izuku, but his gaze burns almost more than Izuku's fire. Izuku is still 15, still in UA, and is now going up against Bakugo in the battle simulation. He and Uraraka are stationed outside the building, the villains are holed up in, waiting for the signal to proceed. For the first time, just stepping in front of Bakugo isn't going to be enough. Izuku can't just let him have his way and wait for his rage to burn out, and he can't depend on the fact that this is only a class activity for Bakugo to hold back. No, for the first time, Izuku is going to actually have to confront Bakugo. Izuku sighs, lowering his mask from his lower face to let it rest on his collarbone. Uraraka, he calls quietly. 
and the girl instantly focuses on him. He had caught her staring at his costume earlier, as if transfixed, muttering about bunny ears and tails, but when he had asked if his costume looked weird, she had vehemently denied it. It's perfect, she had insisted solemnly, with almost frightening intensity. Zuko had no idea what was going on, but he'd been too intimidated to ask. Yeah, Deku, she smiles, and the way the nickname rolls off her tongue sounds so different from how he's used to hearing it. A half strange smile comes across to Zuko's face as he thinks of the person who gave him that nickname in the first place. Kachan, I mean, Bakugo, is most likely going to come after me. I can lead him away from you. Do you think you can find the nuke in the meantime? Uraka looks questioning. Are you sure? Zuko doesn't know if she's asking if he's sure that that's the best course of action, or if he's sure Bakugo will come after him. Whichever it is, though, the answer is still yes. The worst-case scenario for us is facing off Ida and Bakugo at the same time. Ida's speed will make both him and the new Carter to capture. And Bakugo, his raw power, divide and conquer, is our best strategy. As for whether Bakugo will come after Izuku, well, like it or not, Izuku has known the boy for the past decade. He'll come. Uraka doesn't seem to notice Izuku's grim thoughts as she clasps and beams. Oh, divide and conquer. That sounds so cool. All right, I'll find the nuke in no time. Leave it to me. He smiles back at her softly. Can you tell me more about your quirk? We can work on a plan. The timer's up, and Izuku and Araka uh, steal into the building. They part ways as soon as they get in. Surprisingly easy, thanks to Uraka's quirk letting them float up through a window. And Uraka takes the stairs as Izuku winds around the floor, straining his ears. Not too long after he picks himself up on the sound of footsteps and breathing around the corner. It looks like Bakugo had been looking for him, too, probably planning on an ambush. Unfortunately for him, Izuku had spent early childhood holding his breath and attuning his entire being to Hisashi so that he could either hide from the man or step between them when he started beating Ninko. In terms of experience in this game of cat and mouse, Izuku simply outclasses Bakugo. He doubles around the corridor to find Bakugo waiting to ambush him. He creeps up silently from behind, and then Izuku ambushes him. Izuku shoots towards Bakugo with the capture tape in his hands, and Bakugo narrowly avoids getting his legs entangled in the tape by blasting himself into a wall. He curses loudly as he hits the wall hard, and Izuku also curses internally. He'd been hoping to take Bakugo out as quickly and efficiently as possible, but now that the ambush had failed, things are bound to get messy. Deku! Bakugo roars as he gets to his feet as if to prove Izuku's point. Fucking fight me for once, he spits. Fight me with your quirk. Uzuku would like to avoid that as much as possible, thank you very much. So when Bakugo rushes at him with his signature right hook, instead of using his quirk, Uzuku grabs the blonde, flips him over his head, and throws him. But it looks like Bakugo has learned from the ambush and is ready this time. Even as he goes flying, he uses a blast from his palms to break the fall and come rushing at Uzuku again. You shitty... He throws a punch, arrogant, aims a roundhouse kick at Izuku's head. Bastard, he hisses, throwing both of his arms forward and firing a blast. Izuku dodges the blows, slowly inching back and leading Bakugo away from the staircase that Uraraka headed to. She hasn't contacted him yet, so he needs to either capture Bakugo or stall for time. So instead of keeping silent, Izuku decides to start talking back. I really don't get it, he says. Between you and me, I'd have thought you were the arrogant bastard. Why do you insist on calling me that? It's the most lip that Izuku had given Bakugo in all ten years of their acquaintance. And Bakugo looks so bewildered that he outright stops his assault. He stares at Izuku like he can't even believe what he's hearing, and that reaction startles Izuku in turn. He'd just been trying to buy Uraraka more time by stalling Bakugo. It is the first time he's really talked back to the boy, but he'd never thought what he'd said would garner such a reaction. Why? Why do you even... You don't even... Bakugo kind of gapes at him, and then he starts laughing harshly. He presses the palms of his hands into his eyes. Fuck, he says. Fuck, all this time I've been trying to, and you don't even... Fuck! Bakugo lowers his hands and glares at Izuku. His eyes are accusing, hurt. All these years... You never once deigned yourself to even show me your quirk, and the one time you do use it, use it to save me. How the fuck is that not looking down on me? He laughs again, a harsh bark that sounds like it hurts. And that's not all. 
You keep stepping in front of me, but never use your quirk, like I'm not even worth it, and the thing is, you never even look at me. Bakugo is snarling now, raising his right arm and pointing it at Izuku. He hooks a finger into the pin, sticking out the grenade, like a support item, on his arm. Fuck it, I'll make you look at me. I'll make you use your quirk. A mad grin overtakes his features, and Izuku can only watch Frozen with wide eyes. Fucking look at me, Deku. Look at me. He pulls the pin. The blast rocks the entire building. Izuku barely manages to shake himself out of shock, just in time to dodge behind a corner out of the way of the explosion, though not before his left arm is hit by the blast. But pain has never really bothered him, and he can't force focus on it all right now. He really hadn't been expecting much when he asked Bakugo that question. The boy had a grudge against Izuku since they were seemingly for no reason at all. And Izuku had been too used to Hizashi's causeless violence that he never really questioned it when the same came from Bakugo. But that had been the problem, he realizes. Bakugo reminded Izuku so much of Hizashi that he'd seemingly transitioned his mindset from one tormentor to the other. But the thing is... Bakugo isn't Hizashi. He'd never been Hizashi. Bakugo had taken the fact that Izuku had a quirk, but wouldn't use it as an insult, a way of saying that he wasn't even worth it. And of course, Izuku didn't mean it like that, but he can understand how Bakugo could have taken it that way. So then there's only one thing he'd said. Stop looking down on, he, on me, he said. So, and Izuku never meant to, but maybe maybe he had, because every time he faced down Bakugo's rage and explosions, all he could ever think was, you have nothing on my father. Bakugo's desperate and almost hurt expression comes to mind again. Look at me. Look at me. Let it never be said that Bakugo Katsuki is not sharp. He had known, even before Izuku himself, that Izuku wasn't seeing him as he was. Izuku had been seeing Bakugo almost as a substitute for Hizashi, and that had been why the blonde had always been so mad at him. And that doesn't change what Bakugo did. It doesn't change that he was a bully, that he was a bad friend, that he was a bad person. But it does change Izuku's perspective. After ten years, he finally feels like he understands Bakugo. And he feels... sorry. Uraraka's voice comes in through the earpiece as Izuku gets up, letting him know that she's found Ida in the nuke. She's almost right above where Izuku is right now, but Izuku has more pressing matters at the moment. No matter what kind of person Bakugo is or was, and no matter whether Izuku meant it or not, the fact still stands that he heard Bakugo. And Izuku, well, he's never been able to leave someone in need of help. All right, Kachan, he calls, stepping out from behind his cover. You win. I'll fight you. His hood had been blown back, and his left arm had been grazed by the blast, but his mouthpiece is still hanging in place around by his neck and resting at his collarbone. The mask is one part he deviated from his mother's handmade costume and commissioned for a support item. It's sturdy, white mouth guard with stripes on the side, and it's midsection with holes, and it goes over the lower half of his face, fully covering his nose and mouth. The important part is, it's fireproof. Izuku had hung it around his neck, and now he brings it up to in place over his mouth. If he has to breathe out fire, the mouth guard will keep it in without Izuku having to desperately clamp a hand over his mouth and half smother himself in an attempt to keep the fire from touching anyone else. The mask itself is effectively like a muzzle. It lets Izuku use his pull without having to worry about breathing out any fire. Bakugo needs help, but the kind of help he needs or wants from Izuku isn't hugs or words. No, if Izuku wants to help Bakugo, this is what he needs to do. He spreads his feet in a battle stance and raises one hand towards Bakugo. Come on then, Kachan, he says, burying his teeth in a grin behind his muzzle. I won't bite. Bakugo looks surprised, but he didn't really think he'd actually be able to get Izuku to fight him. But then his entire face lights up. Finally. The fight that follows is surprisingly short considering how heavily loaded it is. Izuku pulls, and Bakugo is yanked towards him with a yelp that turns into a delighted and half-crazed, if you ask Izuku, laugh. He grins while bringing around his right palm mid-air, but Izuku had been on the receiving end of that particular move too many times to fall for it. He dodges around the blast, getting behind Bakugo. Pressure from his quirk builds up, but this time Izuku readily spits out the fire pulling in his mouth. He lets out the flame and coughs, hacks, and and hacking through his body. Tendrils of smoke rise out of the holes in the midsection of his mouth guard, but not a flicker of fire is seen outside. 
But the most important thing about this mask is that it keeps the fire in without Izuku having to force it back with his own hands. In other words, it frees up both hands. Bakugo is already turning to face him, but even as his body is shaking from the coughs that rack it, Izuku grabs the collar on Bakugo's costume with both hands, swings him around into a wall. Even while face planning, Bakugo shows his remarkable battle sense and manages to aim a palm back behind his back and blast Izuku. He hisses, forced to retreat, but he pulls Bakugo after him, catching the blonde in his arms in a parody of a hug. The only thing is, Izuku's hands are holding the capture tape. What the fuck? Bakugo doesn't even get to finish his sentence as Izuku deftly wraps the capture tape over most of his body and his lower face, effectively trapping his arms and legs and gagging his mouth. Izuku has idolized Eraserhead for two-thirds of his life, after all. As a hardcore fanboy, he, uh, practiced his hero's favorite uh, weapon, after all. Villain Bakugo captured, a mechanical voice rings out. Bakugo squirms, but the capture tape holds strong. Izuku coughs up some fire and grins down at Bakugo, though he probably can't see it, though the mask is still covering part of his face. The glare that Bakugo gives him is less murderous and more resigned. It's progress. Uraraka, Izuku calls, are you still in the same place? Deku, a relieved voice comes over the earpiece. Oh, thank God, yes, but Ida keeps moving the nuke out of my grasp. I don't know what to do, and we're running out of time. Izuku looks up at the ceiling. He could join Uraraka against Ida, as was his original plan, but he's not sure if he'll be able to use his pull against Ida's speed, and there's not enough time for trial and error, so... Keep close to a wall and tell me where Ida is. Once you see the signal, float yourself up and go for the nuke. What's the signal? You'll know it when you see it. Izuku then proceeds to drag Bakugo to a corner of the room. Being tied up like a cocoon, there's nothing Bakugo could do about it except futilely kicking his legs. Izuku sets them in a position, mindful of the stream of Uraraka's voice as she details Ida's position for him. When Uraraka informs him that Ida has taken to the opposite wall from her, Izuku takes Bakugo's left arm, points it to the middle of the ceiling where neither of them will be caught directly in the blast. The grenade launcher in Bakugo's right arm has already been used, but the one on his left is still intact and full of his explosive sweat. Bakugo's eyes widen in realization and outrage. Izuku grins again. Sorry, Kachan, but... If you didn't want me to take advantage of you, you shouldn't have shown it to me in the first place. He hooks his finger in and pulls out the pin. The ceiling is blasted apart, and Izuku thinks he hears a startled yell from Ida. He waits a moment more, and that mechanical voice rings out again. Nuke retrieved. Winner. Hero team. Izuku is sent to Recovery Girl to get his left arm patched up. Even though, in his opinion, it's not anything worth fussing over, Recovery Girl seems to dis disagree, though, and tuts at him disapprovingly. Didn't I tell you not to make this a pattern? It's only the second day of school, and I've already seen you three times, including the entrance exam. She continues fussing over him, and she treats the burns and the blisters Bakugo's blast left on him. But she peels away more of the sleeves of his tattered costume, and the woman stills. These are some old scars, she says quietly. Izuku looks down to see what she's talking about, then has to hide a wince. There's a reason he always wears long sleeves. Uh, um, yes he says awkwardly, pointingly avoiding the questioning eyes boring into the side of his face. He knows the old, jagged, crisscrossing scars on his forearm aren't pretty, but he's not about to tell her that Hisashi had gone through a phase where he was particularly fond of jackknives. At least she hasn't taken a look at his back yet. There's an awkward moment as Recovery Girl scrutinizes Izuku with questioning and heavy, loaded eyes, but Izuku does his best to avoid meeting her gaze and fidgets. Eventually, Recovery Girl ends their one-sided staring contest with a resigned sigh. Fine, heaven knows you teenagers can be stubborn as mules, but from now on, if you get hurt in any way, when you come to me and don't just try to tend to it yourself like these. She taps lightly at the web of scars. You hear, young man? Izuku ducks his head. Recovery Girl's a professional. She seems to have deduced just from seeing the way the scars formed that his younger self had tried to awkwardly treat the wounds alone instead of getting proper medical attention. Yes, ma'am, he answers. He's soon let off with a firm kiss on his cheek, but even as he leaves, Izuku feels her gaze weigh heavily on his back. When Izuku gets back to class, his classmates flock towards him like excited puppies. Oh, hey, Midoriya's back. Man, that was some awesome stuff back there. We couldn't hear what you guys were saying, but that was heated. It was so cool how you were able to reverse ambush Bakugo and how you used his own attack to win divine retribution. 
The first match was so intense, it got the rest of us all fired up. I guess that's to be expected, since you two placed first and second in the practical. Mm, and the way that you were so quick to use the capture tape was really impressive, too, Ribbit. It almost looked like how Aizawa Sensei used his capture weapon yesterday. Izuku hides a win, a win said that last startling accurate question, or a observation from Sue, as she insists. They go around making introductions until Uraraka approaches him a little bit nervous. Hey, Deku, I'm not sure if it's the right thing to do, but um, that Bakugo guy asked, well, told us to let you know that he'd be waiting for you outside. Izuku blinks. Huh, that's new. Uraraka, bless her kind soul, looks worried for him. Are you sure it'll be okay? It looked like he wasn't really nice to you. But Izuku smiles at her. Thank you, Uraraka, but I think I'll be all right. Deku. Izuku turns to find Bakugo straightening up from the wall he'd been leaning against and approaching him. He has this bag slung over one shoulder, his shoulders slouched, his hands in his pockets, and that signature scowl on his face, but Izuku knows Bakugo well enough to recognize that the expression on his face is nowhere near actual anger. He looks conflicted, like he's received a present, only to be told he can't open it until Christmas. "'I've been trying to get you to use your quirk since we were five, he begins, "'and I finally did, but even then you only used part of it. "'You didn't even use that fire I know you have.' And Izuku's heart leaps to his throat, his fire. How does Bakugo know about that? Even when using his pool, he'd kept it smoldered so that even All Might found, only found out about it after Izuku said it. Ah, uh, of course. Bakugo must have seen it when he first saw Izuku's pool. Back then, Izuku had faced the slime villain, but he hadn't yet thought to breathe fire out of his mouth, so he had to risk pushing it out of a flame in his hand. And Bakugo had been right behind him. Of course, Bakugo had to be the one person to see his fire. Of course, it had to be the one person who wouldn't rest until he got what he wanted out of Izuku. Because life isn't fair, and it certainly isn't kind. Bakugo continues, running a hand over his face. And even so, you still beat me. And there's that ice guy, and that ponytail bitch, too. Shit, just shit. He looks up and meets Izuku's gaze. But fuck them, and fuck you, too. I'm not going to lose to them. And I'll make sure you use all your quirk and beat you at your best. I'm going to be number one, you hear? Then he stalks off, but his shoulders aren't as bunched up as they usually are. He watches his childhood friend, can he call him that, walk away silently. For the first time in ten years, he feels like he understands Bakugo. Being a, a bad person is not the same thing as being a villain. And sharing a few traits does not make Bakugo into Hizashi. Kachan, he calls out. Bakugo pauses his steps to look over his shoulder. Izuku gives him a half-smile. I'm not going to use fire. Bakugo bristles at that, but Izuku continues on. But that has nothing to do with looking down on you. I never meant to, and I'm sorry for not seeing you as you are. Bakugo looks at Izuku for a long moment at that apology. Then he scoffs and turns back around, though there's something about his posture that's even more relaxed and lighter than before. Whatever. I'll make you use it, and you better keep looking at me, you arrogant bastard. The corner of Izuku's mouth quirks up slightly at the insult. I'll make you use it, he'd said. Good luck with that. This concludes Chapter 4 of Burn Your Wings. I'll be picking up with Chapter 5 as soon as possible. Hope you guys are still enjoying this one. Thank you all so much for listening. 